Hey everyone, welcome to Grow Sessions. This is Tony Pavlakis with TSI Grow. I've got my uh, good friend Mike Denellith on the phone. Um, I'm uh, on the call here from World Insurance. How's it going today, Mike? Good, Tony. Good, Tony. Happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome, brother. Awesome. Well, I know we always try to set up some pre-calls and like have some good dialogue beforehand so we can kind of stay on track because we can definitely go down rabbit holes. Um, <laughs> yes, so why don't we just jump right into it? Why don't you just tell me about... Um, where you're from, like where you came from, how'd you, uh, how'd you get started in the cannabis industry and with insurance and everything? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I started out in the Massachusetts cannabis industry back in 2018, um, saw a really cool opportunity to kind of overlap my interest for cannabis, my personal involvement with cannabis, and then, uh, the professional side of being able to service cannabis operators in Massachusetts with the, the newer industry. So, um, I ended up building uh, an insurance program for cannabis businesses as a brokerage, meaning we can go to many different carriers and service many different types of clients. Um, and the focus was Massachusetts. Um, at the time, the agency was growing and uh, we started looking at some more national opportunities. You know, Vermont, New Mexico uh, and Florida were all of uh, interest and kind of got me integrated more into the national atmosphere uh, surrounding the cannabis industry. So um, currently, I uh, moved over to a new agency to lead their national cannabis division. Um, so I'd have a team of agents that work with me in various parts of the country, all looking to start their own uh, cannabis books of business. And I'm fortunate enough to work with them on uh, best practices, how to work with uh, the different cannabis operators that we all serve, uh, and build a really strong uh, uh, network uh, throughout the, the country. That's awesome. Dude. When you say brokerage, I know you, I just wrote something down. So yeah, there's a couple of like different types. So there's like you rep as world, you rep different insurance agencies or you're your own. Like, how does that, how does that, you define that for me? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Big misconception. And uh, when people think of insurance is, um, you know, are you the carrier or what, what does a broker mean? Yeah. Or that's how does like that all work? That's yeah. So the the two um the two kind of subsections of insurance are captive agents which captive agents are uh those who work for an insurance carrier directly an insurance carrier holds the money they're the ones who are actually paying out the claims okay uh, and they don't represent any other insurance carrier other than their own okay. um, and, then, and then you have a broker which is what my company is world insurance and we represent um I would say 90 to 95% of every insurance carrier in the United States. And that's for cannabis and non-cannabis. And that's duly because of uh, World being a large uh, supporter of acquisitions. So we are going into other states and um, bringing on agent, existing agencies that have existing books of business, existing relationships with insurance carriers, and bringing all of those different carriers into our network. So, you know, regardless of whether you're in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, South Dakota, uh, Ohio, uh, we have regional and national insurance carriers to support any market in any state. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Now, with that same thing, so as a broker... Would you actually now, like if it was like an MSO or a big multi-state operator, or even just like a regional operator, would sure. you be able to cover them from state to state or does it have to change? Uh, I'm going to, I'm probably screwed up. Uh, does it change <laughs> carriers? So they're, they're, they're insured by a different person or can they have the same policy covering different, different grows in different states? So at this point, a lot of the insurance carriers that service the cannabis industry are national carriers. Okay. Um, most are based out of the West Coast. Um, we're starting to see some pop up in the Midwest, but um, and then some of the regional carriers here on the East Coast are starting to get involved with, uh, you know, kind of dipping their toe in the water per se. Yeah, I can see um, that. But but yeah, I mean, if we're talking about a multi-state operator and they're in let's say five or six states. Um, all six states and all operations, whether it's retail, cultivation, delivery, labs, extraction, um, all of those can be actually on the same package. So they can all be with one carrier, one policy, one finance agreement, um, oh, wow. and it, it doesn't have to be serviced by multiple brokers in multiple states. It can all be serviced by uh, one person in one office, and then just traveling around, you know, to visit different sites and to work with the different uh, professionals at that MSO that would handle insurance. That's really cool, man. I like that. Um, yeah. I mean, kind of just segueing right into it, what are some of the, 
like going into cannabis, I know I'm sure there's different policies and different coverages for dispensary, manufacturing, retail delivery. I mean, there's, there's so many different little, I'll call them subcategories within the cannabis umbrella. What do yeah. you feel the most important pieces of coverage for, I mean, cause we do cultivation. Yeah. What is the most important stuff that you're seeing right now for cultivators? What should they have? Yeah. For cultivators, um, quite frankly, that's my favorite class of business. Um, you know, uh, I, I like to, uh, kind of think of, um, cultivation is where it all starts. I mean, but also sure. personally, you know, I did my own growing at one point in time. So I understand the logistics that go into, um, setting up uh, a small scale grow, but then looking at something like your background, uh, yeah, where there's hundreds sure. of plants in a room and then you have multiple rooms, you know, there's a lot of logistics that go into that. So if you can understand that on a micro level, you can understand that on a macro level and really expand it out. So when it, the reason I bring that up is because when we're talking about different pieces of insurance coverage, it's why is it important, right? So yep. the number one most important piece of, uh, of insurance for any cultivator would be product liability. Um, okay. Product liability required pieces of insurance here in Massachusetts. Um, the CCC um, uh, is is pretty good in setting their boundaries and saying, here's exactly what we need for limits, for deductibles, um, and here's where, where you can make out the uh, certificate of insurance to, to say, hey, we are a cultivator, we have appropriate insurance. Um, but product liability basically is exactly in the name it's liability associated with the product itself so if anybody was to get sick or injured off of a cannabis plant or smokable flower or even the biomass as it goes from one stage to the next mm -hmm. uh, that liability would either um help the cultivator in the defense uh in, in defense when a claim comes uh, or it would pay out any type of injury so um, we've made some really great contacts with uh, legal teams around the country, especially up here in the Northeast, um, where if there is a claim and a cultivator is getting sued for product liability, thankfully we haven't had any claims yet, but if and when the time comes, we're able to refer a cannabis-friendly lawyer to protect a, can a cultivator through the insurance policy. That's pretty, now does that, so it's a, does that protect just like I'll call it the consumer versus the person that's working on it? Is that a different type of coverage? Uh, like, so the person that's working within the grow that doesn't cover them, that's a different coverage. That would be a different coverage. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So um, yeah, the, the next piece of coverage that's pretty important. Um, again, another Massachusetts requirement and most required, uh, most states require this piece of coverage, but it would be workers' compensation. Okay. So, yeah. So any type of uh, claim that happens while somebody's on the job, you know, somebody falls from a ladder, maybe they um, are, they, they get sick or injured uh, due to uh, the plant being exposed to different areas for too long. You know, something that may come to mind um, is working in like the trimming and bucking room mm -hmm. and having a lot of that um, kind of the dust come up, coming up off yeah. the flowers, um, you know, the keef as they call it. And yeah, uh, it, cool. It, and ingesting that, you know, without proper PPE, you know, different things like that, that's workers comp, as long as the right safeguards are in place to try and reduce the loss and prevent losses. Um, those types of claims would be covered on workers comp. Um, you know, product liability, though, goes a lot further than just the cultivator. Um, it go it extends out to almost every branch of the supply chain. So um, from the cultivator to the delivery company, delivery company to the product manufacturer, and then back to the delivery company, and then over to the retailer, uh, where it eventually gets into the hands of the consumer. So yeah. um, even though it may not pay off um, injury payments for all of those different uh, pieces of the supply chain, like a retailer may not be fully responsible for mold or mildew on their flower or just deteriorating product, um, it will definitely cover that business with defense costs. It will cover their legal fees as sure. they go and look at who is actually responsible for that, that nasty weed. Yeah. That was actually when you just kind of segued it great. And I was just thinking like, okay, so cultivator grows it, they package it. So there was, this is kind of a two part question. So does the packaging matter like on the product liability, because if they're sending it over in bulk bags or like a bulk tub or something, and the person is, I know each state's different. Some states do require to have everything in individual 
you know, are they in, are they in eighth packages or are they in a certain size package? But there's many States. It's like, you can still, it looks like a big candy jar. You can just pick your nugs out of there. They just weigh the shit up and it just goes. Oh so yeah. It's kind of cool. But I mean, I, there's probably some sort of liability because there's, there's something that there's this handling, there's proper handling that goes down to SOPs and it goes back and forth into the grow room. Like you say, proper PPE, are these people taking care of this product? Is it yep. just sitting in a glass jar that's not really sealed and they're not really take? I mean, they're taking okay care of it, but it's probably you're opening themselves up for some risk. There is. And um, it, it's actually great timing that you asked that because a uh, a cultivator client of mine here in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, you know, my hometown, shout out. Um, yep. uh, shout out actually, Fitchburg. <laughs> our, 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 hey, our zip code is 01420. So, I mean, Love 420 it. is literally in the zip code. So, I mean, <laughs> awesome. It, it's awesome. So, point being is um, uh, they're the one of the co-founders of, of one of the businesses here in, in, in Fitchburg put out a really great piece on uh, packaging for their flower. And um, a lot of what they do is, is preventative measures from keeping um, any type of pests or mold or any type of deterioration of product from happening while it hits the shelves. Um, you know, one of the big things they do is they package all of their flour in black jars. So it's glass, which I guess glass compared to other types of materials uh, preserves the, the the cannabis flower and actually enhances the the terpenes and the the cannabinoid pro profile as it cures inside of the glass. So glass is number one. Um, having a black glass um, is think of it like a uh, like a soda or even a beer. Um, yeah, you know, having a, having a can or you know some sort of a dark glass prevents any type of sun oxidation, so it keeps the flower fresher. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you mentioned, you know, having a seal, everybody has to have um, some sort of a seal on their jar or their packaging to make sure that everything stays fresh. Um, but, you know, this is becoming more mainstream. People are finding more renewable ways to say, OK, if we dispose of these after they're opened, you know, they're not just going to go in a landfill. They're going to find something that's a little bit more eco friendly. But yeah, can um, they be they, recycled? Can they be if it's a even if they're using a plastic, can they grind it down and use it for the decking or whatever it, chairs? It, it, it turns out to they, they break somehow. it down and re recycle it. That that makes sense. I I just think that's that's just good environmental practices too. I mean, I think right goes back to SLPs part of it where people are like, are you doing the right thing? Right. But point being on why I bring up some of those points is they're all preventative measures. So once the flower actually leaves the facility after after it's it's uh, harvested, trimmed, dried, cured, and packaged, um, they know that, and they've been pretty consistent with their uh, reviews uh, throughout the last year that um, every time uh, a consumer is buying their their product an eighth or so from a a dispensary, it's always fresh. So, but right. Is there any insurance? I mean, I might I might just be going down a, a rabbit hole, which is my life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you know those like um the little pouches. I'm not going to name the name because I, I mean I'm not sure if I can. But there's yeah. like there's a couple companies out there that have the name that help it either cure better, it keeps the moisture content down. They use them in like cigars and like <laughs> cigarette boxes. Does yeah. that make a difference? Because again, if it's keeping the product more safe, that's like if if they're in every package they're putting in that little thing that looks like a freaking tobacco pouch. I don't know how else to put it. It's like a little pouch and it yep. just keeps it either the humidity proper and it keeps, if it's keeping humidity proper and keeping the humidity down or up, it's probably preventing some aging, some poor aging, you know? So I bet you that's a big, big thing too, you know, if they're doing the right thing. Exactly. If um, a lot of States have um, different shelf life regulations, you yep. know, how long can print products on a shelf. And I think in Massachusetts, you can keep a product on a shelf until it's a year old. Which I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I'd want to go buy weed that's been on a shelf for a year and has like dust on the top. But um, you never know if it has one of these pouches in it and it's keeping everything safe and it's in a black jar and it's glass and has this you know seal on it. Hey, it may still be good, but you know we're still so new into this whole industry with all these new products that are coming out. Yeah, um, we're gonna we're gonna start seeing a lot of this uh, data come to to through to all of us. Uh, I would say within the next couple of years, but. Um, cool. but, but data drives our entire business, man. You know, it, we can't really, um, give out insurance unless we know what the risk is and have data to back it up. So, um, with examples like these and data that, you know, is going to be coming in over the next few years with different scenarios like this, 
um, we'll be able to better adjust our rates and probably provide better coverage. Or um, like we were talking about earlier with the, uh, the the big national insurance carriers versus the regional carriers that are not you know really getting mm -hmm. into the game yet, um, data like this where we can show products being kept more carefully um, and a higher uh, higher quality over a longer period of time. Um, those are the different data points that will convince regional carriers to give out standard insurance policies for, you know, legal cannabis businesses. So we have data um, for behind it, which is yeah, they'll be classified like a restaurant or an auto body shop, you know, one, two, okay. three Main Street, instead of being kind of this, you know, the black sheep of the family. Oh. You know, it's Incredible. it's one of those things where you know data is driving us to a point where this will become more normalized. Um, and I mean, over the last six years, I'll give you a perspective on premium here because these numbers are gonna are pretty crazy. Um, Picture, uh, I'll, I'll use a, a single location dispensary just as, a, as an example, um, just for the number's right. sake. Um, back in 2018, when I first started out in the cannabis industry, uh, and we had to abide with the CCC um, uh, insurance regulations, which is uh, general, general liability and product liability. So two different pieces of coverage with a million dollars per occurrence and $2 million aggregate over the course of the policy term, meaning you can make two $1 million claims, you can make four $500,000 claims, whatever the case may be, you have up to $2 million. Um, and the deductibles for each of those pieces of coverage cannot exceed $5,000. So very specific in their regulations. Um, back in 2018, that coverage was about $20,000 mm. for a single location. Um, and now that's per year, that's per year. That was back in 2018, towards the end of 2018. So as you can imagine, all these new dispensaries are popping up, you oh know, but by the way, those insurance requirements in Massachusetts go for every single cannabis operator, whether you're a cultivator, delivery lab, everybody has to have those. So everybody's paying 20,000 at a minimum. Um, now we, uh, we just did a quote for a, a small operator here in mass. They're just getting started. So um, you know, they're at minimum premiums, which is a great example. Um, general liability is coming in right around 500 and product liability is coming in right around $2,000. So 500 a year and 2000 a year. Yeah. So we're at 2,500 bucks versus 20,000. See, that's pretty awesome. But I mean, again, I think that just like knowledge in the industry, like anything like knowledge is king and data is king. So they don't know. So there, there is the fear. And I mean, I mean, I always kind of like parlay or segue it into you know with like a funding situation or because if they don't know like how, like it's that risk like there's people that will take risky they'll take a risky play in the industry and other people like not touching it like they're like it, you could be running everything like a true like corporate business which most of them are getting there but some people aren't they're still kind of in this le legacy world and they're just going to try to sneak around and do wonky shit but right um, it's still like i i think that uh, people the knowledge has come around a little bit better the policies that are like they're starting to understand it that although they are we'll call it risky it's probably no riskier than a liquor store i mean it's it's a liquor store not. costs more because i mean drinking and driving and stupid stuff Right. I mean, you, every liquor store, every restaurant that serves alcohol, they have to have a liquor liability policy. Um, exactly. Dispensaries are kind of weird because they, um, you know, they don't really have the same type of cannabis liability, you know, in terms of, um, uh, you know, being under the influence. But, um, you know, your your insurance costs are still triple, quadruple what that of a liquor store is. Um, yep. So, you know, when we look at the actual security, you know, arguably uh, dispensaries are more secure than a liquor store. I mean, oh God, yeah, dispensaries uh, like grow uh, like stuff. I would love to see somebody make an argument for the other side, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I no, like, no, yeah, not not, not happening. Close. So we covered product liability and workman's comp. What's like? What is a, like a third or fourth? Are there more? Are those the two most important? I would say um, commercial property is is very important. And uh, the reason why I say that is because it has a lot of subsections. Um, and this is actually where, um, you know, TSR Grow comes into play um, and where sure. I've actually seen um, a lot of uh, equipment manufacturers and equipment leasing companies. This is kind of where their, their playground is, per se. If you want to 
um, kind of make the connection between a cultivator and, uh, you know, an equipment company. Okay. So um, one of the biggest subsections of commercial property is um, your either your inventory, your crop, or your equipment. Um, any of those three will be your largest piece of uh, uh, of coverage, unless you own your building. As you can imagine, these buildings get pretty expensive. You know, the larger okay. you go and um, how updated they get. So, um, but when it comes to equipment, um, this is something where everybody can ensure their grow lights, their watering systems, their racks, their humidifiers, their uh, HVAC security. Probably you have to do your HVAC. HVAC. That's a big expense too. Yep. So all of that equipment that uh, you have in your grow facility, that's all scheduled out specifically on a cannabis specific insurance policy that says cannabis grow equipment. Interesting. So, you know, does, that, does that cover like processing equipment too? Like, so if someone is doing like extraction and doing like cold water hash and all that stuff, so you can get a policy that covers your equipment in case, so like the coverage, would it cover like failures or product failures or what, what does that cover? I mean, it's yeah, so it would cover, um, you know, standard losses, fire, wind, hail, snow, theft, vandalism. Um, what's that? Does it cover flooding? I'm just curious. I mean, um, you'd have to get a flood insurance policy, okay. but you can sure. cover that on there. Um, okay. You know, we actually have a cultivator who is bordering right up to a river uh, here in Massachusetts. And I mean, when I say they're bordering it, they're they're basement was reinforced to withstand the the currents of the the river the hitting the water. building well, uh, I, well you, I mean you bring up a good point because they put a lot of these grows to let's be honest there's a lot of old mill buildings here in the northeast go new jersey new york north yeah and it's probably in a lack of better words a depressed area and that's where they're, they're kind of like trying to do like an urban redevelopment of these buildings or try to repurpose them so they're like, hey, listen, let's dump all the cannabis places over here in Holyoke on that little island of, and there's water everywhere because all those old mills ran on water. Well, that's, I, mean, I, I was going to say that is the one, the, the mill building I referenced, uh, it used to be an old mill that had the big, the big wheel that was going yeah. through the river. So um, it was pretty cool to see that. But at the same time, it's like, okay, well, you have this huge rushing river that never slows down. It's always at, you know, however tall and you have to have flood insurance. So that's another piece. It's outside of commercial property. It's a whole separate policy, but that also covers equipment, um, you know, from any type of flood loss. But, you know, on a standard policy, yeah, it would cover fire, wind, hail, snow, theft, vandalism, um, and a various uh, amount of other pieces of, uh, of coverage there. But, um, you know, for, you know, for example, with TSR Grow, um, okay. you know, you guys have a great system where you guys don't have your drivers inside of the rooms. So, um, you know, your stack would actually be your stack and your lights would actually be something where you can, a cultivator lights on their policy. And if it's within some sort of a leasing program, we can name TSR grow as the loss payee. So if there's, is ever a loss, Interesting. TSR grow gets paid, but it's through the cultivator's insurance policy. So it's actually really interesting. Yeah. And that's something where, you know, a lot of these newer businesses that are picking up, whether they're cultivators or processors, um, you know, they're leasing their equipment with a lease to buy option. Um, and the leasing company is always listed as a loss payee, but the coverage goes on the cultivators policy. Yeah. Uh, you know, almost asking for proof of insurance. It's, it's a contingency to get the loan, to get the lease, you know, like with your car, uh, like, you know, listen, like I have a car loan on my car. Yep. I mean, it all depends on how the policy or who you have for a thing, but like, I'm not like, I want the bank to be covered and like right. the, the bank the bank needs to be paid off if something yep. happens. Yep. Your car yeah. note, your mortgage, it's the same thing. You yeah. Know, if, I just if, need this stuff being taken care of. Yeah. If another entity has any other interest in terms of owning your equipment, owning your building, um, you know, that's where you're, you're, you're going to end up paying that late leasing company instead of paying yourself and then leaving it up to you to pay the leasing company. So now, it's a is that different with, like you said before, if you own a building versus if you are leasing a building and now you said that's a little bit different. Um, so kind of, because when you're leasing a building, you have a landlord and, yep. um, what I'm starting to find out is a lot of folks, uh, are common owners of, you know, their, their building and their grow facility or their retail or whatever it may be. Uh, but it's through different businesses. So it's two separate entities. So when you're talking about a landlord, a landlord ha has a policy that's called a lesser's risk only policy. And that's, you know, the lessor or the landlord 
uh, ensures the structure of the building, kind of the bones of the building per se, um, as well as any common area liability. So think of hallways, elevators, parking lots. Um, yep, yep. That's that's where the landlord's going to be covering their butts. Um, and I mean, a, a lot of the time, these folks have triple net leases, sure. and in that is mm -hmm. including insurance costs. So although we have a separate insurance policy for the landlord, the cultivator still pays it. So that's included in their monthly fees. So you know, take it another up adding cost. Just add another added cost to the cultivator or the, the business owner. Exactly. Minutes. Just keep chipping away at that that overhead, you know? Yeah. And everybody thinks that it's like the green mile. They're like, oh, they're making zillions of dollars. They're like, are they? I'm like, dude, I'm like, you don't even understand the costs to run this thing. Um, right. Uh, so I wanted to touch one more thing on commercial <laughs> property because this is pretty pertinent, um, especially with, with you guys at TSR Grow, um, is crop coverage. Yeah. Um, so crop coverage would be ensuring basically what you have behind you in your uh, your screen there. Okay. So, you know, living crops inside of uh, an indoor grow facility, um, anything from your seeds, your seedlings, all the way through veg, flower, uh, harvested plants. So your actual, you know, as soon as you chop them down and you're you're about to either go hang them or put them wherever they go to, to dry and cure. Um, and then during the drying, curing and packaging process, it's all insured. And then uh, when everything is packaged, labeled, and put in your vault, uh, that's all crop coverage. Um, now, what about like the growing side of it? So, like, if there's, I mean, I, I get it. Like, there's uh, at some point the person has to take some responsibility to the business owner of, of a cultivator. Like, if I'm not a good grower and I'm running, there's a big investment into planting everything and popping seeds and making clones and having moms. Right. But if you, I mean, I hate to hate to say, if you're not a very good grower and like the shit's just failing, that doesn't really does that. It's probably hard to ensure that because it's there's, like you're taking on some of that risk. Like, hey, listen, you're just not good at it. <laughs> I mean, you need to say it. Yeah, and and you know what? Um, you know, it be being bad at growing, unfortunately, isn't a covered cause of loss on our insurance policies. You know, and, and rightly so. I mean, at some point, you have to take on some of that risk. Like, hopefully, you have someone that. And I've actually, dude, I've had customers in different states that say that like they'll have, they, they recognize it early, like just say something happens, like they just don't know, like they're growing, growing, growing. And the plant has been grown and cloned and cut and, and crossbred and all this stuff. And they pop some seeds and they have two great harvests. The next one they plant, oh, they're four or six weeks in, they're like, there's, there's no flower coming out. They're like, there's something happened. And they're like, they don't even know what they have. They're like, we're just, we're going to cut it all the way down. Like we're, we're going to cut our losses now. So we're not feeding, lighting, this, all this, and all these expenses that like, okay, we're halfway through our grow. And actually the plants are doing what they're supposed to do. If we can't fix it in these amount of days, that's it, man. They're like, let's, let's call it a day. Like let's replant this because we're going to spend, I'm like, you can figure it out, especially with our system, like with the power, but like your nutrients, your water costs, your utility costs for HVAC, all of a sudden starts stacking. Like every day it's costing me this amount of money. If I don't think I'm going to get this harvest, I need to just fish or cut bait, baby. <laughs> Throw, yep. yep. <laughs> burn yeah, you got to cut, you got to cut your losses early. Uh -huh. You, you got to, you have to learn that. So you have to have a, you, that's why that having an experienced grower and I'm not saying experience, like if you or I grew in a tent, yeah, we can grow in a tent, but growing at scale is a, that's a whole nother beast. Well, that's the thing is, is kind of like what I, I led off with today is, you know, I've done micro grows. I've, I've grown four to six plants in my own house. And, you know, I've, I've, you know, regulated the temperature. I've regulated the environment, the watering, the nutrients, the whole nine yards and got a pretty solid yield. Um, but managing hundreds or thousands of plants at a time. I mean, that's a, that's an art form. That is a science. Yeah, it's an undertaking. Uh, and I mean, if you don't have a, uh, a really good certified, a uh, head grower, you know, manning the ship, um, you're probably set up for failure. Um, and, you know, that's something that we always go over when we talk with cultivators is who is uh, your point of contact? Who do you have running your your grow? You know, you can have a great COO, you can have a great CEO, um, you can have, have a great chief scientific officer for all I care. But if your grower is uh, new to the game, doesn't know what they're doing, just maybe a little bit uh, lackadaisical in their SOPs. Um, you know, that's unfortunately not covered on insurance, but yeah, well, why would, I mean, it can't be. I, I will, uh, I will tell you though, there is a piece of coverage called equipment breakdown coverage. It's built into commercial property. And that's if any of your systems fail and that failure results in a uh, a crop loss or an inventory loss, or even a loss while the plants are curing and drying in their own separate room. 
um, you know, let's say your HVAC system goes down, for example, um, you are, as long as you have uh, maintenance contracts in place on your equipment, you know, every six months, every quarter, every yeah, whatever, year, whatever it, it may be, as long as something's in place, um, you will have coverage for those plants. You know, okay. you'll have you'll have coverage to fix your your HVAC system, no problem. But because your HVAC system went down, you just lost, you know, a yeah, it whole was, yield. You know, you just lost. Keep the keep the maintenance package going because like you you just lost hundreds of thousands of dollars versus, hey, listen, I got a small payout to fix my AC for forty grand or twenty grand. Exactly, <laughs> and and we just we just put a uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of spoilage coverage in on that equipment breakdown uh, section for a cultivator. Um, I think it was like a hundred bucks for the year. Yeah, so like like you you you, it's very important to have it. Um, speaking about like different like we're talking about insurances and. Every state, I'm sure, varies. I'm yeah. sure it's a different coverage because, like you were saying before, there's like the state, you know, the state requirements. You started in Mass, you live in Mass, so you really know it. What does, how does Massachusetts differ um, from other states, like regarding insurance? I mean, do you, I mean, I'm sure you have to know it or you have to have that person in that state that really understands the state coverage. Yep. Um, but like, how does Mass differ from New Jersey? Yeah. So, um, Good example for for Mass versus New Jersey is Massachusetts has specific uh, liability limits, like I told you earlier, mm -hmm. um, that, that every single licensed operator needs. Okay. Um, now, New Jersey, on the other hand, um, they don't have any piece of coverage spelled out through um, through their their cannabis board. Uh, okay. that, that's something where you know they kind of just say, well, in New Jersey, you you know any business has to have workers comp. Um, and then in New York, for example, um, every business has to uh, offer some sort of a, a uh, uh, like an employee benefits liability coverage um, or long term mm -hmm. disability or something along those lines. Um, same thing with with Mass in New York and New Jersey. Um, every business, if you have a vehicle, has to have a commercial auto policy. Um, but there's nothing specific to cannabis. So that's where these businesses are coming online, whether it's a cultivator or a dispensary. They're really relying on us as professionals and experienced uh you know cannabis uh kind of dwellers to advise them appropriately and say what do i need you know what yeah. are the pieces of coverage how do i get it in place and how do how, more importantly how does it apply to me you know okay. they want to they want to understand just like you with car insurance me with car and home insurance you know whatever the case may be um in the event of a loss how is this going to help me and yeah. more importantly how are you going to help me prevent those losses? You know, who are you going to introduce me to? What resources do you have? Um, what is the most common loss and how do I avoid it? You know, that's our job as risk managers to say, you know, hey, um, you know, HPS lighting and HID lighting is causing a lot of uh, fire losses in the cannabis industry because those bulbs can get, you know, upwards of a thousand degrees. Oh, yeah. So not great for plants, not great for humans. So you have a workers' comp exposure, you have a crop exposure, you have a fire exposure. Um, hey, I have a great resource that can come in and rectify that. Um, and that's not only going to reduce the, the loss uh, ratio for all of the industry, but it's just going to build a stronger business. You know, longevity is what we want to see because quite frankly, and I use this saying a lot, you can coin it if you'd like, um, it's not about how much money these businesses are making. It's about how much money that these businesses are keeping. Because if you can, if you can think of, about the margins and these small mom and pop growers, or even some of the MSOs, so some of the better MSOs, yeah. um, their margins are still slim. I mean, what was it? Three out of the top 10 MSOs in the country were profitable last year. Dude, I mean, I think we've found some stats and we use them in like when we're talking with customers, I think it's less. It used to be like around 45 percent. I think last year, one of the big publications that it's in the cannabis business in the industry, in I yeah. think they're saying less than 24 percent of operators are profitable. That's a giant like that's huge when you see it. I mean, this was like in a public they published that article, I think, in December. Like when you read it, you're like. And we look at like, I'm sure like you look at your customer base, everybody needs to have some insurance, but like we don't have every customer using our solution. But right. when we look at it, we're like, okay, we ask our customers, are you guys, how are you guys doing? Are you guys, and we hope to say that all of our customers are in that 24%. I mean, we don't know because we're just going by what they tell us. We don't see their, their P&L statement, but right. if they're still operating and they're still successful and they seem to be expanding and growing and doing the right things, 
they're probably within that 24% because there's so many of them out there that it's, I've sat on some calls, like I've just like logged in, I signed up for some, some of these things and sat on like a board meeting call and listened to the, hey, we only lost 81 million last year, down from 90. Like, we, so we made 10 million. Like you, you didn't make 10 million. You still lost. Like, we are at You're down net 70. We only lost 80. I'm like, <laughs> dude, I'm like, dude I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Like you didn't. <laughs> You didn't make, you, you lost 10 million less this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a genius. I already know that. But I'm like, I see the, I listen on these things. I'm like, am I oversimplifying it? Like fucking apple pie and oranges? Like, am I just like. A loss is a loss is a loss. I mean, it, it's giant. one of these things where, you know, if you're losing money and you're bleeding money year over year, wouldn't you want to find solutions that actually help you out? You get you back into the black. I mean, be profitable. Like you, like you got. You can't just keep on bleeding it. And you try to explain that to folks, and some people get it, some people don't. But it no, is no. But um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what we're seeing in in you know the the different states is uh you know we're we're getting relied on very heavily to uh, advise them on you know hey here's what your state is requiring. Um, it could be as simple as a surety bond um that shows the state that you have cash if your business goes under. Um, to pay for your licensing fees and whatnot. Um, but then Massachusetts is one of those states where they have very defined um, you know, laws that say, here's your here's exact liability limits, exact deductible limits. Um, you know, we're not overly concerned as to how much it costs, but uh, we do need to see proof that you have those pieces of coverage and those deductibles in place. Um, now, for a state like Vermont, um, that's a very interesting state up there, but their insurance requirements requirements are um, every operator gets. every operator needs to hold commercially reasonable amounts of insurance. Um, so oh after God. asking uh, various members of the um, cannabis control board, uh, the answer I got was um, that is up for you and your other insurance brokers uh, to determine at the time you work with a, a, a licensee. Dude, that's just so vague. Like, I, I, I say this often to customers that I'm talking to them as they're battling with their governing board, their, the Canada's governing board. Yep. And I say, is like the, the states are column experienced states or they have a well-established program. Like I'll say, I'm like, are they, are the, all the programs perfect? Probably not. Cause you can find, you can punch holes in anything, but some of them, like I still have like mass it's, like they've got the, it's defined this is what they have and people will complain about them up and down left and right i'm like god damn i work in a lot of states and internationally i'm like they've got yeah. it they're like this is what we want like yeah. it's it's defined it's it's written it's there's yeah. no there is no vagueness and then but you know people will still complain and some of them are the excessive rules sure but i mean that's that's because of the like you said before the data and the reporting and the information they didn't know so they're like we're gonna actually be extra safe until we can figure it out well, that's it is they don't know what they don't know. So until we start working with more data and providing that data in public forums at public meetings and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, th th I mean, nothing's going to change until that happens. I mean, look what just happened with Massachusetts and the two driver rule for delivery yeah. companies, you know, that's that's after you know a few years of data collection and uh, loss histories from around the country and looking at different markets. And, you know, the reason why it was, uh, you know, supported finally by the state is you know, they were able to get enough data to support their claim. Um, same it thing for insurance, sense. same thing for insurance or any other regulation is everything's backed by data. We have to just do that. Um, and I know that TSR grow and your system has a lot of data. It's very beneficial to a lot of cultivators. Um, something that we see on the insurance side as being very beneficial, um, not just to, you know, the cultivators uh, to have a convenience factor, but, um, from a loss perspective, too, you know, you guys have a lot of really great things going on that we would appreciate, um, you know, if and when there's any claims, uh, you're actually helping uh, the client, but you're also helping us reduce those those losses. So you're basically helping the insurance industry. So thank you for that. <laughs> hey, we're here for you, man. Um, yeah. Speaking of like the insurance industry, what's the difference? Like, how come like cannabis operators can't get um insurance from like the things you see on tv you know something like that like how how come like if i see like the commercials on tv with the little little lizard like yep. why, do, why don't they insure or maybe they do insure and it's a subsidiary of it you know it's probably an off-brand 
Yeah. So, you know, there's there's the Geico's and the progressives and the Liberty Mutuals of the world, you know, all of the all states, you know, the, all they all have their figures. Right. You know, we kind of recognize them on TV and they're easy to recognize. And um, a lot of what they promote is is home and auto, you know, so, you know, yeah, they that's probably the two biggies. The other thing, um, those companies, if they were to ever go under, uh, they will have federal backing to support them oh interesting so it's 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 about the federal regularization and legalization that's interesting yes. so um uh -huh. there so there are other carriers they're regional carriers. they're similar in the sense that i think the state would end up backing them up okay uh, but it wouldn't be the federal government so they have a little bit more uh play in terms of what um, so they're starting to dip their toe into the water. You know, for example, a couple of our carriers are starting to insure landlords of dispensaries only. Um, that they found that dispensaries are the least risky business in the cannabis supply chain. So they'll insure the landlord. They're not going to insure well, the business cool. yet. Um, you know, and by, and on the other side, um, uh, they're also starting to look at insuring commercial auto for delivery operators, um, as long as the right safeguards are in place. Yeah. So, you know, these are regional carriers, these big ones you see on TV. But, um, you know, as time goes on and as things happen, you know, there's obviously a lot of talk right now about rescheduling to uh, tier three within the uh, DEA. You know, that's something where if that ends up happening, some of these big names that we see on TV could open up their doors and say, come one, come all. Yeah. Um, I know for a fact right now that they all have think tanks going on. You know, everybody's exploring options that way. If and when federal legalization happens, um, it's not just the banks. Everybody talks about banks and, you know, financial financial kind of institutions. Um, insurance companies are also at the forefront of this whole safer banking act uh, because we are also financial institutions, not me as yeah. a broker, but the carriers themselves. The carriers themselves. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yep. So if and when things go federal, I mean, that opens up all of the regulations for us to, to start going to the Liberty Mutuals of the world or the Arbellas of well, the it's world. crossing state lines now. So maybe there's one cut policy. And then also as that opens up, then there's like that international coverage, like you have to get separate policies or maybe binders or whatever they call it. Like when you, because I know we do international stuff, you have to have some yeah. sort of coverage. You have to take something out on your policy. You have to get something because you're shipping it by boat overseas to this country, this port of entry, because it's coming in here. There's some, yeah, there's some insurance things that are going on around and there's, it's going to, it's going to open up a lot. I, I, I feel it's, it's exciting. I mean, I still, like you said, like you've been here for six years, I've been here for four. It's just still exciting times, dude. There's it so much going really on. It really is. It really is. Um, quick point on the insurance carriers, and then I want to touch on kind of the fun we're having, because obviously I, I I want to talk about the fun we're having, right? So sure. uh, so with the insurance carriers, you know, I know that there's think tanks going on with these big, big names, because um, a lot of them are already doing business in Canada. Oh, um, interesting. So, that so they are doing it. So they're covering it because it's federal. Yeah, some of some of the most well known insurance companies in the United States have a Canadian branch and are some of the largest insurance carriers for the ca uh, Canadian cannabis industry. Uh, but how does that help or not help or benefit or not benefit the carriers that are in the game now? It's a risk for them, um, as you can okay. imagine. It's it's you know maybe eight to ten insurance companies that are engulfing. Um, the entire United States cannabis industry right now. Um, so, you know, if and when things go federal and now you have the small regional shops, the state kind of statewide shops, even our New England specific carriers, and then, um, you know, you have these big names coming out. Now you're getting flooded. Now you maybe have a hundred different insurance carriers and they can all take on cannabis businesses. So, um, the P and L for the insurance carriers is definitely something that, um, you know, kind of get going while the going's hot. Yeah, for sure. For you sure. know, so they're, they, they want more volume now, which is why we're seeing a reduction in rates. They want to get more folks in the door. They want to show why working with a cannabis specific insurance carrier, even realization happens, uh, is super important. It's such a big industry. It's such a big industry. And if people aren't recognizing that now, 
and it's going to segue back and forth too. Like there's going to be a lot of stuff that'll be crossover. Like this morning I had a call with an international guy that does a lot of agriculture. So a lot of the agricultural practices and agri agricultural pro uh, coverages will probably, it's it's going to blend back and forth. Um, right. I had one last question. I know we want to talk about some fun stuff, but how does lighting impact the insurance and the cultivator? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this is, this is something where you and I have talked about this a little bit. We've started to explore a little bit and I've actually done some, uh, some case studies on this. So um, with lighting, you know, specifically for, you know, a, a convert, uh, HID or um, yep. the other type of bulb light to uh, LED lights. Um, what that does is, uh, as I mentioned, you know, those other types of bulb lights can get upwards of 500 to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit and yep. cause some pretty nasty side effects. LED lights, the the heat still gets high, you know, anywhere between, you know, 250 to three, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. um, but that's significantly less. And I mean, it can be water cooled, it can be fan cooled, you have other means to kind of decrease the temperature while those lights are in the grow room. Um, also, a lot of what we're starting to see is um, what we've seen historically is fires breaking out, uh, whether it's fires from the crop burning, the, uh, the, the, the bins and the buckets burning, uh, the racks burning, the actual lights dropping off and sparking and causing fires. Um, so all of these other bulb lights um, are just becoming deemed unsafe. We've been talking a lot about data today. Um, the data we have on these lights is that they're unsafe to the point where it's actually causing some insurance carriers in the cannabis space to pull away. And if, you know, obviously everybody's hungry for business and they say, oh, we'd love to quote this cultivator. Oh, they have HID lights throughout their whole facility and it's a hundred thousand square feet. Yeah, we're good. We're all set. Um, <laughs> we're good. Yeah. And it, it's a flat. No, it's not even like, oh, we have, we have water cooling, we have fans, we have this, we have that, we have a million different mini splits blowing cold air, all set. We don't want those lights. Um, now, the ones who will take on those types of lights, I mean, you're going to see premium increases uh, on the commercial property section of your policy, not the liability, but the commercial property. Um, you'll see increases anywhere between 20 to 40% just because of the lights you have. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one of the things when we talk about overhead, we talk about costs, we talk about those, those big MSOs that, oh, they only lost 10 million or uh, they don't, they, they only lost 70 million this year. Um, well, you know, if you are using HID lights, which, you know, historically has been the preferred lighting of, you know, uh, legacy growers, oh, yeah. uh, you know, you are now spending 20 to 40% more on your insurance. And on top of that, you're excluding yourself from half of the insurance market because they don't even want to look at you. And, and like you were saying, like I, I'm in my head, I'm processing it as it's a 20, 20 to 40% increase in coverage. Or if they switch to LEDs, it goes, it, it could drop 20 to 40%, maybe even greater. It, and that's one of the things where we did a case study with a couple of cultivators here in New England where they had HIDs and then we explored, hey, if they were to move to LEDs, what is the impact on their insurance? And then what other markets open up? And that was, you know, kind of what we found is that with the existing carrier they had, if they moved to LEDs, it was a 24 to 40% drop in the rate. Um, and you'd get more coverage added on top of just the reduction in premium. So you're get you're paying 20 to 40% less and you're getting more coverage, but then on the same breath, you're opening up another 50% of the insurance market. So you can move to different insurance companies that may have an endorsement that fits your business better, or uh, they have a better loss ratio, or they're better with paying claims or whatever the case may be. Um, but LEDs are, pushing more of these cultivators into better insurance programs because so i'm gonna have you quote it and i'm gonna have gail put a snippet is this is perfect because it's gonna say mike denault world insurance that says if you switch to tsr growing lighting you'll save 20 to 40 percent on your policy oh I, hey you know Dude, that's I'm, awesome I i'm gonna it. go one better and you guys are unique and i love what you guys do because you guys don't put the drivers inside the grow yeah. rooms and that's oh, no, something that's where a, a box. The, the insurance companies don't even know i mean i had a, I had a claim i had a claim uh 
here in Massachusetts, won't name the cultivator, but um, they had a power surge and uh, they had uh, they had LED lights, but they had drivers on top of their lights. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with the power surge, 25% uh, of their lights in the drivers, they all, oh, popped, well, popped. they all caught on fire. They did cause, it caused a 90% crop loss. Holy crap. So, you know, when we're talking about LEDs, yes, LEDs will save you a lot of, of money on your insurance because LEDs versus any other type of light are safer. Um, now we get into a whole other section of lighting that nobody in my industry is looking at. And it's the drivers, you know, the actual power source for these lights, you know, where are they? What are they doing? What temperature do they run at? And at what point do they, do they yeah. pop? You know, so with you guys putting the driver outside of the, the grow room, that's new data. That's new data that the insurance companies don't know about. The regulators don't know about. That's something where, you know, you guys are on a whole different level when it comes to risk management and loss prevention. Yeah. And so and that, yeah, and it's something I'm excited too because you know we want to see our our clients succeed. We don't want to see them have claims. We of want course. to see them on time. That's awesome, man. Well, Mike, this has been awesome. I know that we're running, we're, we're coming up on the hour timeline. Yeah. I know we could you and I could chat for a while. Um, I want to thank you for coming on the show, but how can people get a hold of you? I know Gail will post it and we'll have it like we'll have an image for it and like how to get a hold of you when we do all our postings. But how can people, what's an easy way for people to get a hold of you? Is it is it Instagram? Is it through a phone number? Is it through a website? Is it an email? Yeah, absolutely. So um, people can go uh, to my LinkedIn. Um, I'm always okay. available on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> I'm also on Instagram. Uh, Mike.Denault is, uh, is, is my uh, handle there. Um, and then if you want to go to our website, um, that would be, I'm just pulling it up for you right here. Um, worldinsurance.com. Yeah, I believe it's worldinsurance.com slash, uh, cannabis. Okay. And that should get you to the page. You'll see my mean mug on there. Um, and you'll okay. get a whole bunch of information on our cannabis program. And then, uh, there's a, you know, at, reach out kind of section there where you can get in touch with me. This is great, man. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, love, I mean, and insurance, like you and I've chatted about it, like in like most people's mind, insurance isn't exciting. But when you start really thinking about the benefits of like having the right insurance and talking to the right person, that's super knowledgeable. It's not just like, hey, listen, we have cannabis coverage and the, but they're not giving you the why. I I love it. I love chatting about it, dude. But thank you yeah. so much for coming on the, the show today. Um, everyone, this is my good friend, Mike Denault from World Insurance and reach out to him if you have any questions or need some need something answered on your on your policy coverages. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate you Thanks having me on. All right. I'll talk to you soon.